uh, um, Trish, Izzy, Lara. I'm not going to go through the list of all the important people here. The all important, by the way. But thank you all very much for raising this, organising it, and getting Fraser and myself. I played a minor role and continue to because it is, you know, very much in relation to uh, the possibility of surgery. Uh, but of course, one's got to think of the broader picture which, as you pointed out, Elephant, is very important in any patient, but particularly in patients with Ehlers-Danlos syndrome and with the multi-yield comorbidity which they have. <coughs> I'm going to be talking about dysautonomia and giving you some idea. You probably know as much about it and possibly more about it than I do, but if I can just share a few aspects in relation to this uh, with you. And on this slide, uh, I begin by you know, thanking the various people in the different units I've been associated with, mainly at St. Mary's Imperial College and uh, Queen's Square, the National Hospital in UCL, over many decades, by the way, and over the last five years at the Hospital of St. John and St. Elizabeth, where we also now have an autonomic unit. And so in, in combination, they have educated me enormously along very, very importantly with our patients over the years. So if I might begin with uh, the first slide, um, in a way this is really to indicate that uh, I'm, I'm going to elevate myself now. I'm going to compare myself. I think you know who this is. This is Daniel in the Den of Lions. And that lions are a compliment, by the way. They're on Her Majesty's and, and the England. Uh, um, so uh, you, you recognize that, as I said. Uh, because in a way, you're all focusing very much on the neurology and the neurosurgery. But the autonomic nervous system does come in, and I'm going to try and convince you about that if you're not, as it were. And so my outline, as it were, of the next few minutes is going to be why the autonomic nervous system, that might not be obvious to those who may be looking at this later on, what are the key manifestations, I think it's important that we have both subjective, which is largely from the patient, and objective, which is a combination of investigations and evaluations. I'll talk very, very briefly about the treatment of POTS, which is one of the major issues here. And also, again, if I do not remind me about the importance of pre and post intervention evaluation. Important for us on the autonomic side, important for all of us, including on the surgical and other aspects. <clears throat> so the autonomic nervous system, now you know this pretty well, but very quickly, uh, one normally thinks of the autonomic nervous system as a peripheral system, as an efferent system, as it's called. And most people think of it as largely sympathetic. And as you will see here, that's the sympathetic coming from the spinal cord, innervating every organ in the body. But a very important component is the parasympathetic, and there's a large cranial outflow, which one can see there, and then, of course, a sacral outflow. And again, this is innervating every organ in the body. So it's important for organ function, but essential for combination uh, events such as the control of blood pressure, heart rate, temperature regulation, which are essential for survival, uh, not just in terms of organ function. Um, I just thought I'd bring up the fact that the brain plays a very important role here, um, in, in addition, because there are different autonomic uh, centres within the brain, something which takes me back, and I must give credit to, uh, to Hugo Critchley, who started this with us, with uh, Ray Dolan and myself, uh, at the start of the last millennium, using functional MRI, and uh, with, with a lot of work indicating how important it was, particularly in relation to cardiovascular control. For instance, here in a normal subject, you can see lighting up of the anterior cingulate uh, gyrus over there uh, tremendously, and you can see the difference between what happens in a normal subject with blood pressure and heart rate going up, and in a subject with autonomic failure, where there's far less activation and virtually no change in blood pressure and heart rate. So a very sensitive and valuable mechanism into the peering into the brain, as I think of it, in trying to find out what central brain pathways, uh, centers and pathways are doing. Coming back to this slide, which uh, encloses the brain in this situation, this is to just make the point that with this uh, intricate uh, supply of nerves from the brain and spinal cord going to every organ in the body, there's ample scope for things to go wrong and cause autonomic 
failure or autonomic dysfunction. You could have lesions in the brain, the spinal cord, the periphery, or the organs themselves causing a lot of problems. Today is going to be the focus on the craniosurvital junction, a very important area because the brainstem just above plays a key role in autonomic function, amongst others. There's the spinal cord with the nerves coming down. And I try and compare it, you know, when I think of our neurosurgeons here, with uh, uh, the geographical comparison, by the way, is with the Suez Canal, which is figured in very various ways. This, this, uh, this canal, as it were, is really quite a, not quite, is essentially, uh, is, is an essence uh, for, for functioning and our survival. But that's you're going to educate us all on later. Now, what are the autonomic manifestations in EDS? Uh, the, these are the, the core ones, cardiovascular, uh, POTS, postural tachycardia and pooling. There are many more, but I'm just giving a few examples. The GI tract, gastroparesis at the top, constipation, lower end, a whole range of urinary features, and pseudomotor, as I noticed myself in the Bakerly line this morning, where it was very hot. I did I think I have temperature dysregulation, but this is a factor which can be very troublesome in a number of our patients. Now, how do patients present in a whole variety of ways, and this lists some of the ways in which they can. Uh, faints, funny turns, falls and fits. I do apologise at this early time of the morning to be using one of those, wor one of those letters, in fact, rather consistently, but they're not four-letter words except for one, sorry, fits, as it were, over there. But these are really the, what patients tell us in relation to, in medical jargon, dizziness, presyncope, and syncope. But a point I want to make over here is it doesn't necessarily have to be autonomic. It could be cardiac, which is probably the most common in certain age groups. It could be autonomic or other neurological causes. And I think this is very important when one sees a patient with EDS. Um, one shouldn't focus entirely on the autonomic. One's got to think more broadly because you're entitled to have more than one disorder or condition. And just to give you an example, uh, with patients such as this, it could be due to damage to the autonomic nervous system, Parkinson's disease, spinal cord injuries, diabetes, common, common conditions. And then, of course, the intermittent ones, POTS and autonomic mediated syncope, which about a third of POTS patients at some stage usually have. This is to make the point, therefore, that, that uh, objective evaluation testing is very important to, con to uh, confirm the diagnosis and ascertain the extent of involvement. And for this, you need an appropriate setup. So this is one of our autonomic laboratories. Uh, you've got, this is, by the way, one of our team who's, uh, who's a model, as it were, for this. Um, equipment which fortunately over the last few years has advanced tremendously so even with a small amount of equipment you can get an enormous amount of data uh, from there and a tilt table is one of the essentials and that's to look at the effect of gravity I think we have a Mr. Newton here so we owe a lot to Isaac Newton and this is one of the key stimulus stimuli as it were for all of us, for me in particular, while I'm standing up and talking. Uh, you can see the equipment here, including that you've got cuffs. So we try to ensure it's as non-invasive as possible, which is essential if you're having repeat investigations. And it means you can get an enormous amount of data, as it were, on cardiovascular and autonomic function in different situations. For this, of course, you need experienced people and experienced and empathetic staff. And we've been very fortunate. It is important uh, to provide the best service possible. Just to give you an example of what you might see, on the top you can see a continuous output of blood pressure. That's the blood pressure systolic and diastolic there, before, during, and after head up tilt. That's the heart rate in, uh, in a purplish color over there. So there's hardly any change in a normal subject when they're tilted. This is in a subject who's got autonomic damage. So autonomic failure, very different from autonomic dysfunction. The blood pressure plummets down, there's hardly any change in heart rate because these nerves are not acting. This is what happens in a patient with POTS. On the left is a normal subject, blood pressure and heart rate maintained. This is a patient with POTS. The blood pressure can be low, it doesn't necessarily have to be low, but look at the heart rate. It's shooting up as soon as the patient is tilted head up. That's the effect of gravity. And the diagnosis is usually when 
uh, the uh, rise in heart rate is over 30 beats per minute. That's the arithmetical uh, uh, um, figure which is used. Um, in addition to the testing, we also test for adrenaline and noradrenaline. That's for the blood sample. And that's important because if the heart rate's gone, we want to make quite sure there isn't an excess of adrenaline, as one example, which is contributing because the treatment there could be, could be different. Now, this is all laboratory-based. I think it's very important that you have home-based measurements also. And we've devised uh, a protocol so that our patient subjects take this home. There is a whole range of activities which they go through so we can get a measure of what's happening uh, with key stimuli in daily life. And this shows some of the outputs, as it were, from over a 24-hour recording. That's in a normal subject, blood pressure going down at night, that's asleep there, heart rate also going down. This is a patient with POTS. Similar blood pressure changes, but look at the heart rate shooting up. Not at night, when the subject is asleep, but when awake. And we come to what causes that, of course, which is seen in another patient here, which is analysed a little further, mainly while standing, after exercise, after food has not been listed here. This is the red. I used to consider this to be the Manhattan skyline before with these lines, and I don't know whether I should be proud or otherwise, Fraser. We do have the London skyline now, which is competing, I think, with it. Um, now, it's important we've talked about tilt, but it's very important that when relevant, other stimuli in daily life are used. And the two key ones are food, the effect of food, and I won't show you that because there's not much to show you in terms of that, and the effect of exercise, because both these are essentials in a way. Um, and we perform our exercise test lying down so we can separate out the effect of standing from the effect of exercise. Now, one of the things is also both in the clinic and certainly in the laboratory when there's greater opportunity is to, is to make other observations. And these are the observations relating to what we call peripheral vascular pooling. So if you look at the feet, this is the same subject, by the way. This is with the subject standing up. This is with the subject lying flat. And I'm sure you will hopefully clearly recognize, even from the back, that these are the effects of peripheral vascular pooling. Some people have it mainly in the legs because that's the most dependent. Some have it also in the arms, uh, which is dependent in a way too, but not to the same extent. And it's of some relevance because it's the pooling which might be the trigger, amongst other causes, for the tachycardia and the POTS which occurs, and the problem sometimes with low blood pressure, and also fainting. And uh, forgive me for using this, this is as an aid memoir, as it were, and uh, by the way, this has nothing to do, I have the highest regard for Her Majesty and her troops, by the way, but this is what can happen if you're standing upright for a while uh, and still on a hot day and with a uniform which enables your temperature to keep going up, as it were. Um, you don't even have to mention the referendum, by the way, because I thought it's very relevant with what's happening these days. What are the key features in POTS? mainly women, but we see uh, many more, particularly young men these days, as compared to before. I'm not sure why, whether it's the referral patterns, which, which varies. They have dizziness with postural change, exercise, and food. It depends on the food, of course. Palpitations, a proportion faint. Now, I just put these two in there because this was my uh, observations at the start of the millennium, too, until I met Rodney Graham. Um, they appeared disproportionately disabled, and quite often there was not much to find, say, neurologically, as it were, other than the autonomic side. You know, until later the penny dropped that a lot of them, in fact the majority that we see, have got Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and have got the features, which if you're not looking for it, you're going to miss, as it were, or you can miss. Uh, uh, that's the definition, by the way, of POTS, which we talked briefly about. Uh, now, in addition to the cardiovascular features in POTS patients. Of course, there are a number of non-cardiovascular, and this is important because there is an interaction. One can make the other one worse. Sometimes it's treatment which can make the POTS worse. And of course, we know about the gastrointestinal, bladder, and temperature regulation, and some of the drugs used there. But I just mentioned a few here. Uh, mast cell activation syndrome, vasodilatation, whether it's due to histamine or maybe other substances, why this occurs more commonly, I'm not sure. Maybe this, in discussion this will come out. But dilatation of blood vessels can cause problems, can cause increased pooling, 
increased tachycardia, increased symptoms. And so treatment of that is important. This is just mentioned because uh, we're going to be talking a lot about Chiari. I just brought in also small fibroneuropathy. Uh, there are a number of patients who have a condition known as erythromelalgia. That's at night. They've got painful red feet in particular. Quite often, not necessarily linked to the small fiber neuropathy. So again, all these aspects need to be factored in and they can make POTS and the autonomic side worse. I thought I'd put up this slide. I'm sorry for a very busy slide, but it makes a point, in fact. Uh, when you've got patients with POTS and EDS, to whom do they go and why? Now, you might think, of course, if they've got autonomic problems, they should come to an autonomic doctor. But how we define ourselves, I think, is a bit of a problem. Uh, we don't quite have the IST, as it were, which the others have. Um, and this, and you can see going through this list, they could go to an enormous number of specialists uh, or can go initially to one of many, from cardiologists to gastroenterologists, to neurologists, to psychiatrists, sometimes sadly so, as it were, obviously rheumatologists. This, by the way, is alphabetical, by the way. I'm not uh, elevating or bringing down anyone. Very sadly so, as I found, less so now, fortunately, a number go are thought to have something known as medically unexplained symptoms. Now, that in a way, there are many ways of interpreting this, but knowing some of the people who have labelled patients we've seen with this uh, uh, and from what I've heard, it really means that these patients do not have, of course, an explanation that it's all in the mind and that they should go and see a psychiatrist. Uh, so these are the ones who I call disbelievingologists. And if you've got a better term for this, please do let me know, because maybe this should be a subspecialty, as it were, too which should be avoided, I quickly add, you see, by, by patients with autonomic uh, dysfunction. Now, I did say I'd speak the most briefly about management of POTS, and this is just to, to indicate that there are non-pharmacological measures, quite important, a whole range of pharmacological measures, depending upon what you find, what the problems are. Uh, and then it's very important, by the way, that any associated disorder or condition is managed, because there's you have great difficulties, for instance, if there's bladder infection is one example, because the POTS and autonomic features can get considerably worse. I, I, forgive me for plugging this as it were, but uh, I've got uh, you know, one of the co-authors of this paper sitting over here, which is uh, Rodney, Rodney Graham. Um, this was our experience uh, some years ago. Since then, we've got a lot more, and it's in progress, in fact, uh, from the HJE, Hospital of St. John Elizabeth, we've seen uh, almost a thousand patients in the last five years, and the majority have been fully worked up. Of course, we don't have the longitudinal thing, but we've also had the fortune of having them seen by the experts. Neurology, rheumatology, neurosurgery, assuming that they haven't come from that source if they've come from our end. So we've got a tremendous workup and data there, which is going to be very important, but a lot to be analysed. So uh, watch, watch the space, it should emerge. So just to summarise, POTS is not a disease, it's a syndrome, it's a very important autonomic biomarker, which we talked about there. Usually, not essentially, there's multi-system involvement, there can be multiple comorbidities, and hence the importance of a holistic approach. And so if I come to, to finalising it, I hope I've made the point that it's important that clinical assessment is, should be at the start uh, on a subject who's got an autonomic dysfunction in EDS. Autonomic testing, if it's thought to be dysautonomia, is very important. A, to confirm the diagnosis, exclude other factors, because as I said, no one's immune from getting some other autonomic neurological or cardiac condition, which can cause problems. Understanding the pathophysiology, which helps us with our targeting of therapy, and I think a very important component is evaluation before and after intervention. And this is where, along with our subjects, it's so important to have their subjective biomarkers assessed. And of course, as clinicians, have the objective ones also done. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening over this period. And I hope I've given you some idea, for those who didn't know about it, of course, most of you do, about autonomic manifestations. 
in Ava Stendhal Syndrome. Thank you. Question and answering now or at the end? Uh, maybe uh, did I see an earlier slide where um, mental effort got something to heart rate? Is that correct? That's right. That was one of the tests which was used with. I mean, we use it also. Yes. Uh, what is happening there? So, what do you ask? Do you ask a patient to think or, or work out a problem. Well, the test, well, there are a variety of ways of doing this. The one which we use is mental arithmetic, which is uh, addition of seven. And if we've got a, uh, you know, um, a numerical genius, as it were, then it's the subtraction of seven or various other things to make it a little more stressful. It is, a, in essence, a stress test. So it's one of three tests, stress tests that we use. One is sustained hand grip for two reasons, because it activates the nerves, raises blood pressure and heart rate, uh, and can be useful also in the management and treatment, one of the non-pharmacological mental arithmetic in different forms, and there can be a whole range of, of mental stress uh, testing, and cold, so uh, putting your hand into a cold... Uh, what is happening in the uh, mental stress test? Well, the, 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 the centres are activated, they, they activate activate the sympathetic and or the parasympathetic, which is the basis of the initial studies that we did with Hugo Critchley and Ray Dolan, and hence the lighting up of various areas in the brain, which is evidence in vivo, as it were, uh, that, uh, that there are autonomic centers which are activated with something which may appear as simple as mental arithmetic. The, the locus ceruleus sort of innovates widely through the brain, mm -hmm. intimately with it. Absolutely, yes. Those, um, it's getting better and better, by the way, because you saw those large areas with the technology at the time. We're going back almost 20 years, by the way, because this was started with Hugo doing his postdoc work with us at the end of the uh, 90s. Um, and so it's getting much better, including in the brainstem, as you say, the locus ceruleus, and in the brainstem, which are small areas, very important and active areas. So things are going to get better and better in terms of our understanding what happens in normal subjects, as it were, and also in subjects who've got different conditions. Sorry, this is a tie between the two. <laughs> it's just an observation um, from my, um, my other patients. I see that uh, I've got a mobility in the physiotherapist. Um, many of them comment that their syncope or pre symptoms come on when they exercise. And when you actually work with them, you realize that they breath hold. So they breath hold, then they get their symptoms. So a lot of them have really, really awful breathing patterns, mm -hmm. which is probably one of the reasons um, that that's happening with that particular group. But also, with regards to them becoming more and more prevalent in your practice, most of them have a related female family member who also has the condition, so they just recognize it through the family chain. And I think that's why it's been usually moms pushing their sons to come and get diagnosed. Um, and that's possibly why you're seeing more and more of them. Could be. Thank you for those observations. In fact, you raise a very good point. With exercise, I didn't show any slides because of time. With exercise, it's not usually during the exercise that there are problems. It's post-exercise because of the increase in blood flow for obvious reasons, in nutrients, oxygen, and so on, and hence are separating it from standing at the basis of the test. When it occurs, as you say, with exercise, you raise a very good point that one should look at the breathing patterns, as it were, because uh, uh, that does play a role in a number. Quite why, I think, is difficult. I don't know whether anyone's understood it further, maybe you have, as to whether it's a conditioned response because of what happens, or whether it's integral to the problem, Causing it, you know, is up for grabs, I think. I wonder whether it's vaguely kind of like the Valsalva movie, where they basically breath, brace so hard that they push their breath up. Could be, indeed, so, yes. Fraser. So, uh, uh, you mentioned that syncope, pre syncope, could be autonomic or cardiac in spaces. In your experience of, of younger women, say, in the 20s and 30s, you don't have Parkinson's and these other neurological conditions. Mm -hmm. What percentage have a primary cardiac basis as opposed to primary autonomic basis? I, I can't give you percentages, but it's very clear that with 
older subjects, uh, the uh, cardiac causes of syncope are far, far greater. For, in a way, very obvious reasons, because you're more likely to have cardiac conduction deficits, bradycardias, tachycardias, atrial fibrillation, whatever it might be. In the younger population, there's been some very good work uh, by uh, uh, the, the Dutch group, the Amsterdam group, uh, Walter Wheeling. And it's very clear that the majority of young people who have syncope have an autonomic cause for the syncope. You would get, of course, a proportion who might have a cardiac cause due to conduction deficits, you know, Brugada syndrome and so on, but they're relatively small and rare as compared to the much larger group. So I think from his data, he thinks, uh, and, and again, these are, of course, bits of isolated data, uh, which can be very useful, just as the Framingham data was in terms of syncope, zooming up in the elderly, except they didn't have any people below the age of 20 in the Framingham uh, cohort, as it were, followed up. Um, so in, in the young, I think the number one to think of is autonomic. There's no reason why they cannot also have a cardiac one, and this is why one should keep an open mind. And I do have a number who come to me and say, I mean, I'm going to attend, I mean, I do attend a and &E, uh, my GP. Can you, can you provide a sheet on the autonomic and the pot side so that they'd follow your instructions if I say things? And I say no, because they've got to think there's no reason why they cannot have another cause for their fainting or whatever problem they have. Uh, and if one's going down, uh, it, you know, if one's using tunnel vision, that's bad news for the subject and the patient. So, uh, coming back to your question, yes, the age does matter in terms of uh, the frequency and the prevalence of syncope. Andrew. I guess one, one of the things that's been talked about is uh, autoimmune syndrome, because there's a lot of people who have and how the mobile group do you think that plays a role? And is there a role for Thank you. You raise, you raise a very important point, in fact. A very important point on the autonomic side before, because uh, about 20-odd years ago, uh, you know, there were a number of patients which were very clear could well have this. And this is where we started the link with John Newsom Davis in Oxford, who was the, uh, and, and then after that with his younger colleagues, uh, including Angela Vincent, uh, when he, you know, particularly after he sadly died in a car accident, and I think it was Romania. But, um, and, and now, in fact, that's coming to food because there are more specific antibodies. So we're talking about autonomic failure at this stage, which can be detected, uh, which can link up with the autonomic dysfunction, which is noted, and can be treated because the better treatment now, I think it's still entirely, um, not, it's not entirely clear as to which form of treatment one should be using, and it could well be that there are more monoclonal antibody treatments which are going to emerge, as it were, for these. So I think that that's one of those uh, uh, areas where most of our treatment I loosely call palliative. I know they don't have cancer, but in a way like in cancer, you're just treating the symptoms to make things better. With the autoimmune, there could be disease-modifying treatments, which could be very, very important. Now, your question is, does this apply to patients with POTS? And the answer is possibly, but we don't know as yet, because there's a very close link between, say, infection, but also with stress, with also surgery, but also with anesthesia, and various things like that. Quite what the trigger is is difficult, I, but we need better uh, antibody testing. I mean, there are some laboratories where, uh, you know, the whole range of antibodies keep coming back as positive, as it were. They might mean something, but they don't. I've seen relatively few who've been through the mill with uh, autoimmune treatment. Usually got worse, I could clear add, with that. There may be others who are getting better which are being reported, and more will be. So I think that's an important area, but we need the right minds, the right technique, and the right approaches. Uh, and again, following what we all use at any rate, it's clinical evaluation, objective evaluation, pre- and post-intervention, whatever that might be. Right, so I have one question. Yes. Uh, with these parts, obviously you are treating for a long time. So in your experience, you find a patient who is resistant to all the medical treatment, and you should have referred any certain groups of patients for a surgery. And what was the result of surgery? Have you followed them up, whether their parts completely disappear after that? 
Uh, are you talking about surgery? Yeah, cranial cervical. Uh, uh, I have relatively few who I've seen post-surgery. Um, there are some. In fact, there might even be. Well, no. Uh, there are there are some who Fraser, of course, has uh, has operated on, who have done very well. I think what some of them I've seen pre and some of them post, uh, and uh, they have improved. Uh, but we're talking about individual cases. I certainly don't have a cohort, uh, and I think the majority would come from you, Fraser. I mean, you've operated on them as it were. So. Um, um, I mean, in your experience, have you managed to set up a criteria so if this patient has a part, it's a resistant part, it's not responding to treatment, how long do you wait before you think I would refer for a Good, good point. Sorry, I did that. Uh, these patients who went there because of their, new, I think, because of their neurological problems, not because of their autonomic problems. We haven't yet sent anyone, as it were, for the autonomic side, because it's, there's usually a trigger which can be identified, which needs treatment. So, for instance, I mentioned the bladder, I mentioned the gut, as it were, or using a combination of drugs, therefore understanding the basis for that. We haven't, I cannot, I definitely cannot recall anyone who we've sent primarily for having uh, surgery uh, in the in the Suez Canal, as they call it, you see, or the Panama Canal, for uh, for POTS. Whether they incidentally get better, now it could be that the other factors are getting better, so the POTS improve, because there are so many things which impinge upon and can make POTS worse. Any questions? More questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. It's an excellent talk.